Also, we will, be, we will post a webinar survey at the chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Mark Malkoff of uh, Lake Champlain and Lake, Lake Champlain Sea Grant. Mark? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, just, so just a quick synopsis of our Sea Grant outreach efforts on crude oil transport. We're trying to explore some of the drivers of crude oil transport patterns, best management practices, social, environmental, and economic impacts, both positive and negative, associated with this phenomenon. Our goal, um, perhaps a little noble, but is to uh, hope for some better decision making, um, but we're taking a non-advocacy approach in that effort. Um, this is a third of our uh, four-part webinar series. Uh, we've previously delved into some of the physical properties of crude oil uh, and crude oil transport. We've talked a little bit about understanding risks, hazards, and security. Today we're going to talk about spill response topics, and then on August, on August 17th we're going to be discussing regulatory activity and environmental requirements. The whole idea here is that of systems thinking. We're not trying to break this into simple components, but we're trying to expand the scope and focus on multiple interactions, typically with conflicting objectives, relationships, and interrelational impacts. So as Jill mentioned, we've got two presentations today. Um, I'm thrilled to have our, our two speakers lined up, and I'll warn you, we may run over the one-hour allotment just a bit, but um, as Jill mentioned, we're going to have questions posted in the chat session, and then we're going to address the questions at the end of both presentations. I'll try to review, compile those questions, and, and read them back. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ralph Dahlhoff. Um, he's EPA's pre-designated federal oil scene coordinator for Michigan's northern, lower, and upper peninsulas. From July 2010 to August 2013, he served as the EPA Federal On-Scene Coordinator and Incident Commander of the Unified Command for the response to the July 2010 Enbridge discharge into uh, Kalamazoo River. Previously, he helped lead EPA's response to nationally significant events such as the World Trade Center response in Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Ralph? Um. When it comes to the discussion of uh, oil spill response in the Great Lakes, it's important to begin, I think, with an understanding of the national response system. So that's where I'm going to begin today. Uh, Jill, do you see my screen? No, you'll have to reshare it from that quick start menu. So, uh, oh, I see. Okay. Do you have it now? Yes. Okay, great. So, the national response system. Um, the Oil on Hazardous Substances National Contingency Plan describes a system that's been set up to enable federal, state, local, and industry coordination to releases of oil and hazardous materials. It was developed in 1968 following the oil spill from the tanker Torrey Canyon, and it's enabled by the Clean Water Act for oil, as well as by the CERCLA, Superfund Law for Hazardous Substances. It's, uh, the, the natural response system is, is designed to organize federal, local, state, tribal, and industry contribution to response, but also to preparedness for response and planning for response. It's very important in that regard. And here's how it works. Um, when a spill occurs, 
and whether and, and I'm going to focus on oil, um, but anywhere in the U.S. when a spill occurs from an, a fixed facility, a vessel, a pipeline, a train derailment, uh, the, the incident is processed by the National Response Center that many of you are familiar with. This is an organization that is uh, administered and staffed by the U.S. Coast Guard in Washington. Um, and upon receiving report, reports of discharges, the NRC uh, relays that information out to the federal on-scene coordinators, whether they are Coast Guard on-scene coordinators or EPA on-scene coordinators, as well as other agencies across the uh, the area where the incident has occurred. And this happens for all spills of oil, regardless of how extensive or impactful they are. It is then the obligation or the responsibility of the federal on-team coordinators to determine whether the events are being managed appropriately by, at the local level by the spiller and with oversight by local authorities or whether there needs to be a, a federal presence. And uh, when the federal presence is required, that's when the national response system uh, mechanisms really begin to kick in. Funding for response to oil spills is enabled by the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, which established the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund. As most of you know, OPA 90 was enacted in the wake of the Exxon Valdez um, event. The Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund is administered again by the U.S. Coast Guard, and it, it, it is a fund that enables EPA and the Coast Guard Federal Hunting Coordinators to finance in an emergency mode all activities associated with response to a spill, whether it's a, a government-led spill or whether it's an industry-led response cleanup where the government is doing oversight and direction. All the money required to pay for those efforts can be drawn from this fund if necessary. So that's a, a key component of the national response system. Again, administered by the Coast Guard. Superfund is the analog for hazardous substances, but we're not going to talk about that today. So the, the national contingency plan provides a, a a system whereby regional plans, what are called regional contingency plans, area contingency plans are integrated with state and local plans, vessel response plans, which are also required by the Oil Pollution Act, as well as facility response plans. And all of this contingency planning stuff can get pretty intricate and confusing, and um, it's difficult to keep it all straight sometimes. There are many different agencies that are involved in the review and approval of these plans. For example, <coughs> regional contingency plans and area contingency plans are prepared separately by EPA and the Coast Guard most of the time, but historically, some of the time, they are also prepared jointly, especially in coastal areas of the Great Lakes where EPA and the Coast Guard have jurisdiction in the same areas, the same general areas. So contingency plans under the NCP managed and approved by EPA and Coast Guard. Whereas facility response plans are generally um, for, let's say, for pipelines, they are uh, um, approved, they are reviewed and approved by the U.S. Department of Transportation. 
Even though EPA and the Coast Guard are the lead response agencies, DOT approves the uh, facility response plans. And that, that's a source of some clunkiness and difficulty um, that Coast Guard, EPA, and DOT are in the process of trying to smooth out. Um, vessel response plans uh, fall under the jurisdictional purview of the U.S. Coast Guard. So they review and approve vessel response plans. Some FRPs for on-land fixed facilities um, are approved by EPA and the Coast Guard. The, it's important for facility response plans, vessel response plans, state and local plans, all to be consistent with the requirements of regional and area contingency plans, as well as consistent with the national contingency plan. And so, um, like I said, it, it's complicated, it's sometimes convoluted, and we are constantly trying to make sure that all of the required contingency planning that's required under different laws and regulations is harmonized. And it's an ongoing uh, effort. I think that generally we do pretty good, but still there are some gaps in the system, and perhaps we'll have a chance to talk more about that a little later. So again, at the, at the, at the national level under the, under the national response system, we have what's called the national response team at regional levels, and there are 10 of these regions throughout the uh, U.S. roughly. They're called what are called regional response teams, and then in as sub elements of those regional response teams, or in, related to those regional response teams, are what are called area committees. And so, in the Great Lakes region, we have a number of area committees that have been set up to do contingency planning in particular areas. And EPA and the Coast Guard work uh, together to administer these area committees. And then the area committees have to be integrated with the local and state planning entities. So um, the regional plans, again, developed by multi-agencies uh, in, the, in the regional response team. They follow the NCP format. And very importantly, as I said, they have to be coordinated with area plans, local plans, and they need to designate the boundary between coastal and inland zones. And that boundary is important because it uh, signals or it, it determines, it, it's the jurisdictional um, boundary. So in the inland zone, it's the US EPA that has ultimately the uh, bottom line jurisdiction when it comes to responsibility for oil spill cleanup and in the coastal zone, it's the Coast Guard. And this is the last slide in the, in the national response system planning um, part of the presentation. The, the idea here, as I'm sure you're, you're all aware of is to is to have the engagement and the face time with all of the stakeholders in these area committee settings and area planning settings so that all of the local, state, and government capabilities can be integrated along with uh, non-government industry um, resources to to do planning and then to exercise those plans and to actually respond using those plans to actual events, to then evaluate how it went, improve the plans with the long-term goal of over time being uh, leading to an, an increase in, in preparedness because of the cyclical nature of, of doing the planning, doing the exercises and responses, improving the plans. And 
it's a it's a long-standing concept. Uh, it's a it's a slow and tedious one. Um, however, there's no question that it works. And as I get into my next presentation, which will be um, kind of a, a little case study of the uh, some elements of the Kalamazoo River discharge, uh, we'll um, I'll talk about what some of those lessons are or what we've learned about planning. So just, just some highlights from Kalamazoo from the Enbridge Line 6B release that occurred back in 2010. The initial situation was that approximately 820,000 gallons were reported to have been released. And there was a delay in that reporting uh, caused by a number of factors. Predominantly, it was Enbridge that didn't understand that it was having a release, and it took it many, many hours to figure out that it was having a spill. Um, but also because at the local level, there wasn't good understanding of the fact that there was a big pipeline um, present Local first response agencies uh, in the Kalamazoo area were not aware of it, and there was not a good history of interaction among the local first response agencies, the public, Enbridge, EPA, the Coast Guard, the state, the tribes. There was no planning or very little planning. And, and so when the spill occurred, even though there were signs and symptoms of that, it, when it was still occurring that something was wrong, it took a long time for it to get figured out. Um, lesson, lesson number one is that uh, with better planning, better preparedness, it's likely that that spill would not have been as large as it was because it would have been contained or would have been stopped earlier and contained earlier as well. Um, at the point of the break, the oil traveled nearly two miles through a small creek before it entered the Kalamazoo River at the confluence of that creek with the river. With better planning, that probably would have been avoided. So 820,000 initially reported, that was upgraded to uh, 844 later. It was a blend of Cold Lake crude and Western Canadian select. It was a, what's called a diluted bitumen. The Kalamazoo River was in a 50-year flood stage at the time. Uh, there were agricultural areas that were impacted, public parks and recreational areas. The uh, spill traveled for 38 miles through several communities, including the city of Battle Creek. Um, so there were urban areas that were affected, as well as marshes, undeveloped woodlands, and oxbows and overflow areas, especially down in the in the lower end of the impact zone. The one of the next takeaways, and this relates back to the importance of spill planning, uh, was that uh, the government needed to kick in immediately. It was obviously a significant release. Uh, on day two of the release, we issued an administrative order under the Clean Water Act to Enbridge to conduct cleanup activities. And that's a role that EPA and the Coast Guard play with if it's in the coastal zone, it's Coast Guard. If it's in the inland zone, like this was, it's EPA. We, for a spill of this size, and this is called a substantial harm release, it could even have been termed a spill of national significance. And I don't really have time to get into the, the difference, but when spills exceed a certain quantity threshold and impact threshold, the government agencies, EPA and the Coast Guard, are required not just to oversee the cleanup activities, we are required, we are obligated to direct 
all of the cleanup activities. And this was a case where we did that. And we did that using our federal on-scene coordinator authority under the NCT, and we also did it using these orders, these administrative orders. In addition to that enforcement role, though, we also have a response coordination role, which you see in the second half of this slide. And that's where the incident command system comes in in the unified command. We are responsible to coordinate the activities of all agencies and tribal entities and industry uh, entities that have uh, resources at play or an obligation to respond. In the case of the Marshall Kalamazoo River spill, the unified command consisted of EPA, the state of Michigan, city of Battle Creek, and uh, two local health departments, Calhoun Health and Kalamazoo Health, as well as, a, and of course, the, the company itself, Ambridge, as well as a, a myriad of cooperating and assisting agencies. Early on, um, work was focused on the release area. Uh, source recovery is always, or source control is one of the things that you always uh, are concerned with early when it comes to a cleanup uh, perspective or context. Uh, containment and recovery come next. Um, but generally the first thing that that you worry about is public health and then worker safety. And this bill was certainly one where public health and worker safety were, were prominent. Um, this video that you're looking at right now is, a, is of the pipe break itself. Uh, there was a box that was built around it so it could be excavated and the black liquid that you saw was oil coming out of the pipe while the source, well the, well, the pipe was being controlled so that the, the spill could be, uh, the spill cleanup could occur. These next slides uh, show some of the early techniques that were used to contain oil in the creek uh, that, what's called Chalmage Creek, which runs two miles to the, to the river. Pretty standard methods, uh, um, sorghum materials, excavation of heavily contaminated soils, nothing fancy about it. And the takeaway here, and, and this, is, this is something that surprises many people because everyone's heard so much about how diluted bitumen sinks and becomes submerged and is difficult to clean up, which, which it does. But it doesn't necessarily do that right away. And the, the takeaway here is that with any kind of spill, oil spill, whether it's a light oil or a heavy oil, the sooner you get to it, before it begins to weather and sink, the better. And standard recovery techniques work. In the case of the Kalamazoo River spill, within the first six weeks, we had recovered over 760,000 gallons of the 800 plus that had been spilled uh, via conventional skimming and vacuuming techniques, and then we had recovered over another 300,000 um, using ex excavation techniques. Uh, it was only the, the small amount that actually sank that was difficult to recover using um, new techniques that we had to develop for submerged oil. Some of the issues uh, that, that we dealt with uh, included things like access. If you have a spill in a remote area uh, along 40 miles of the river, you can imagine that there are places where it's difficult to get to the river or where you have to uh, interact with landowners to, to get permission to, to access. Um, Here's this little video clip uh, uh, shows uh, an area 
known as Ceresco, which is six miles downriver from the spill site, and it shows oil accumulated in a um, in an area uh, in an impoundment behind the dam. Um, here we're looking at shots of technicians uh, collecting air data, air monitoring data, and also air samples. Early in the spill, we were very concerned about this. We had hot conditions. We had an oil with very toxic properties because of so much. It had so much benzene and the diluent that's used to uh, cut the the dilbit. And and so the slide that you see here are the locations where over the length of the, the spill occurred down here and traveled this way. We had to air monitor and air sample the entire distance, again, in a public safety and worker protection context. And as you can imagine, we did a lot of sampling uh, in the Battle Creek area as well as in the Soresco area, which are uh, inhabited. Um, these metrics over here give you a sense for um, the number of data points. Uh, almost 100,000 air monitoring readings and over 6,000 air sampling readings. And, and, and this was as of the fall of 2010. Over the next three years, we collected even more. Um, evacuations uh, occurred pursuant to some of the levels of contaminants. That's something that people don't necessarily associate with oil spills, but they are, in fact, a, a reality. Um, impact to the environment in this slide, you see uh, surface water activity uh, occurring to evaluate uh, surface water, groundwater, drinking water, um, Irrigation issues. This slide shows some of the metrics associated with uh, sampling, con conducting environmental sampling to evaluate the impact of the spill. And this this is outside of the cleanup. This is just evaluation of impact in the early days. So I would say probably the first 30 days, a lot of this work was conducted. SCAT is an acronym for Shoreline Cleanup Assessment Technique, and it's when you have an oil spill, you essentially, to, to clean it up, you have to figure out how, how it's impacted the water body or the environment. So you have to go out and survey the river in this case. In this case, almost 80 miles of river shorelines, 40 miles on two sides, and you have to document what's been impacted, where, what kind of habitat it is, how it's impacted the river, and then you have to develop techniques that are appropriate to mitigate oil to the extent that you can without being more harmful than the oil itself. So this slide, all of these little green cells uh, are quarter mile segments, so the entire 40 miles of impact were subdivided into quarter mile segments for the purposes of systematically um, mapping the impact, describing the impact, describing the response technique that was going to be applied in each case. And it's kind of an iterative cyclical thing. You, you go through and you map it all out, you do some cleanup, you come back and reevaluate re it, see how it's doing, and you just keep doing that over and over again until you, you've done all that you can and you, you sign off on that section of the river as being clean. Here are some examples of uh, vegetation removal, um, small boat type operations. Uh, as opposed to these shots, which show heavy equipment-oriented operations, which were used in many cases to uh, mitigate 
heavily contaminated, contaminated parts of the site. As I mentioned previously, access can be an issue, and uh, in some cases we had to actually airlift uh, equipment into the locations in order to um, to do the work. Um, flushing is a technique that's often used. Agitation uh, was used to agitate bottom sediment to cause oil that sank to come up to the surface where it could be collected. And ultimately, in the end, after doing all of the agitation that we could safely do, and we agitated much of that 40 miles of river sediment to bring sub oil up, submerged oil up. Ultimately, we decided to dredge three major impoundments along the river where much of the submerged oil had migrated to, and then to let allow the river's natural processes to continue over time to bring any residual oil into natural deposition areas. So that's what you, you see there is dredging activity. Winter work uh, was something that we did quite, quite a bit of. We didn't just, you know, the cleanup occurred over the course of three to four years and so we didn't uh, stop during the winter. In some cases it was even preferable to work in the winter. I'm going to skip to a couple of these uh, because I'm running out of time, I think. As I mentioned, uh, it's a cyclical, cyclical process. You, you clean and then you, uh, you come back and you see how the river has responded. You see what else needs to be cleaned up. Some of the tactics that were used to, to look for oil, aside from visuals, included uh, aerial, remote, aerial imagery, remote sensing, um, as well as actual field surveys. Um, this, this slide shows, uh, it's a depiction of a survey of the river, and the yellow denotes a, a moderate degree of submerged oil contamination as opposed to red or orange. And here's a blow up of an area, just a, a bend in the river where it's been characterized for the degree of oiling. So yellow is not too much, orange is heavier, red would be really heavy. Um, here's some examples of what we call polling, which is a, a way to evaluate the amount of submerged oil. Here, here's a better graphic that shows uh, the distribution of heavy oil versus lighter and moderate amounts. I'll move pretty quickly through these. So, as I mentioned, um, after after three years of cleanup, two of which were in pursuit of submerged oil, we reached a point where uh, we knew that our efforts were uh, beginning to move towards the balance point of doing more harm than good. Uh, and we culminated our efforts with the dredging of three major impoundments, and, and these are big dredge jobs on the order of you know, $100 million cost-wise to do, uh, in, involving the removal of hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of sediment. At that point, uh, we transitioned the project uh, for long-term monitoring, if you will, to the state of Michigan to work with Enbridge on that and for the state to continue to work on any um, any additional work that needed to be done to apply to, uh, to with respect in the context of state compliance with state laws. And so um, that, that occurred back in 2014. So 
uh, hopefully by, by running through this, you, you see what some of the issues are that are associated with major discharges. And uh, certainly this is, I'm you know, just scratching the surface here, it's not a comprehensive discussion of cleanup or planning and preparedness, but I wanted to convey that there are systems in place. In the case of this major release, those systems kicked in. It was a classic national contingency plan type of response. Everything worked like it was supposed to in that regard. We haven't had a similar event since, and one of the things that we've been very focused on, though, is a lot of planning. We learned about the importance of planning. I'm of the opinion that better planning in this area could have avoided a, a billion dollar plus, plus cleanup. It likely would have been down in the tens or hundreds of millions and not have involved submerged oil cleanup. Um, it might have been what we call a dirt job, just digging up contaminated soil. Um, so I'm a big proponent of planning, and I know Enbridge now is. Um, and the big thing that we've been working on more recently in Region 5 when it comes to contingency planning is working with the Class 1 railroads. We're heavily engaged with all seven Class 1 railroads that haul unit trains of Bach and oil. And I think our next speaker, uh, Tom, from uh, the state of New York is going to talk about what they're doing out there um, with respect to working with the railroads on contingency planning for, for spills. So I think I'm probably over my time. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Ralph. Um, at this point, I just mentioned that I've collected about three questions from uh, the attendees. If you do have questions, uh, please uh, put them into the chat feature. Uh, and I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Tom Festa is an Emergency Response Coordinator for New York State's Department of Environmental Conservation Spell Response Program. During 2014, he developed sensitive resource maps for the state's crewed by rail corridors. And over the past two years, has led a team developing geographic response plans for these corridors. Previously, he managed environmental remediation projects at super, super fun sites throughout the state pioneering techniques for soil vapor intrusion investigation. And I uh, want to thank Tom for his efforts to, to get on today. There's been some uh, technical issues that he's been uh, dealing with, so hopefully we can, we can see his slide soon. Hi, this is Tom Fesley. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, great. So now I'm sharing my screen, and, and thanks, Mark, and thanks, Ralph. That was a great talk. Um, let me just get this up for you in full screen here. And Ralph had a, uh, a lot of good points about planning, and that's uh, an area that we've been focused on in New York. So um, geographic response plans. Um, as, as Mark said, I. I work for New York State DEC and uh, in the Spill Response and Coordination section. And as he mentioned, that you know, for the past two years, I've been pretty fully engrossed in developing these response plans to bolster the state's preparedness for a major oil transportation incident. Um, a lot of work on the rails, but we also have the Hudson River, so I had a lot of barges, and we used to have tankers coming up to Albany to. Uh, get the Bakken crude and take it to the East Coast refineries. What you see here on the opening slide is a Bakken oil unit train um, coming down the shoreline of Lake Champlain. As you can see, and as, as Ralph mentioned, we have a lot of areas you know, throughout the country where uh, access uh, is an issue, not just to the rivers or the lakes, but to the train tracks as well. So here's a, a big long train right on the shoreline, stuck between a, a rock and a wet spot. Um, so uh, Ralph also did a good job kind of giving you guys the framework for the, you know, the national contingency plan and all the requirements and facets of, of that. Um, geographic response plans, and I'll use the term GRPs from now on, uh, they are map-based, location-specific contingency plans 
they uh, originated as components of the area contingency plans, um, that, which are developed by the Coast Guard and the EPA. And they've been required since Exxon Valdez in the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. Um, GRPs are traditionally built off of the ESI platform. Um, the ESIs are uh, a product that NOAA puts together and uh, they are focused on shoreline protection of environmental resources as well as some human uh, socioeconomic resources. Um, but they're uh, you know, traditionally developed to identify sensitive resources at risk uh, from oiling from seaborne oil. Um, your traditional, here we go. So the, the ESI maps, uh, you know, handle the, identify what to protect. The GRPs, on the other hand, identify how to do so. Um, the, again, the traditional focus has always been on oil spilled at sea impacting shorelines and getting to the coastlines. Um, there's a new paradigm I've said traditionally about 10 times already, but uh, as you guys all know, you're on the call for crude move. Um, you know that uh, all of a sudden, uh, starting around 2013, um, the oil capacity, the production capacity, you know, outpaced the transportation capacity, and we started moving it by rail. Um, So what we're dealing with is uh, kind of old threats and, and old transportation um, issues versus new ones. It used to be protect the shoreline from spills at sea. Um, the oil spill at sea would be highly weathered often by the time it in, in approached the shoreline. Um, now we've got Bach and crude oil shipped by rail and other types of oil as well. Um, but you, the new concern is spills on, uh, spills on land that could reach waterways or just impact things on land, um, getting into storm drains as we saw in, in Loch Megantic. Um, and, you know, God forbid this, these, this oil, this Bakken oil is highly volatile and flammable and so catches fire easily. Um, hopefully this works for you guys. I have a video. This is a... Uh, a rail car uh, with a hatch open showing a, a full lo fully loaded, uh, I think that's a DOT-111 with Bach and crude oil it's from a few years back. Um, it's very light and sweet, meaning it's got a lot of easily refined light ends and very little sulfur. Um, I'll play this video and you can see that uh, this oil, is, it's got a lot of entrained or dissolved gases and opening the hatch is really like opening a can of Coke or where you guys are pop or soda. I think you guys are all pop out in Ohio in the Great Lakes, but I could be wrong. Anyway, these gases are highly flammable themselves. The gases that's entrained in this oil is propane, hexane, butane. Um, so, we have a lot of track in New York State. We've got two major lines. Um, I know uh, Ralph is dealing with all the seven major lines. We've got Norfolk Southern maybe in the future, but right now it's only CSX and Canadian Pacific. But there's still quite a bit of track, and there's quite a bit of important stuff within a half mile. The half mile is the, is the recommended setback distance um, from the U.S. DOT Emergency Response Guidebook for large spills of petroleum crude oil that are on fire. Um, this map shows the ESI coverage in New York State. So uh, you can see the coastlines are, are well covered, as they should be, as they're required by OPA 90. Uh, however, the uh, main lines that are transporting crude oil, you can see going across the center of the state, it's a red line with um, like cyan blue boxes. That's 
CSX going from east to west and CP from north to south. So we have good coverage of the coasts, uh, but we don't have any coverage of what is truly inland, on land areas. We do have the Hudson River, which is an estuary for 150 miles from New York Harbor, New York City, all the way up to, to north of Albany, uh, the, the Troy Dam. Um, so how were the GRPs developed? Uh, we had this ESI void, so we developed our own sensitive resource maps to fill that void. And we use those uh, similarly as they're used in you know, federal plans and federal contingency plans as base maps for discussions to build, to build into GRPs. Um, we developed the GRPs in a, on a county by county basis. We have 21 out of 62 New York State counties have uh, the crude, crude oil main lines. Um, we have a lot of other track that wasn't shown on those, those past maps, but I only focused on the, the major railroads known to be transporting unit trains of, of crude oil. Um, it was very important to meet with uh, local responders. Now these GRPs, we are really tried to emphasize that they are for the initial operational period before any state or federal assets or even railroad assets may arrive on scene. Um, so we met with county and local emergency response agencies, of course, you know, you've got your firefighters, your, your police, EMS and hazmat teams, but more importantly, or as importantly, we met with the county and local highway departments, the water works folks, um, county health departments, uh, you know, public works and, and water and sewer, because uh, spills on land can get into systems, you know, water systems, uh, especially storm drains and things like that. So these folks were critical to the planning process. We also had plenty of state um, involvement and uh, we partnered with EPA and the Coast Guard uh, in areas, in the coastal areas, whichever one was the, uh, within that area of responsibility. And several meetings, we had both EPA and Coast Guard um, involvement. So we had these, we scheduled meetings across the state in the 21 counties, working meetings with large groups of first responders and you know, the state and federal partners. Um, these were long meetings. We relied on a very skilled contractor uh, to compile the information that was gathered at the meetings. We had, we had 21 counties, but we probably had 30 to 40 meetings because we had follow-up meetings with um, population centers such as Buffalo within Erie County and Rochester within Monroe County. Uh, we provided the local, we basically established a steering committee in each county to develop the response plans um, to, you know, we did the work as the state DEC and state fire did a lot as well and our contractor, um, but we made the plans for the locals. These are, are you know, state developed but locally owned and that was a very important thing that we, we stressed throughout. We often had um, groups of volunteer firefighters to, to schedule around. So we worked nights, nights, weekends, off business hours to meet with them. Um, we've always emphasized what can be done fast, quickly, and with local resources. Talking, uh, you know, one or two people or a small group of, you know, firefighters that might be first on the scene. As Ralph mentioned at the beginning of his, the Enbridge portion of his talk, if there was more planning, it might have mitigated some of the damage. And that's always been our goal, to try to fill that, fill that void and get, get these people thinking across the state about um, what, what could they do and what would they do. So we tried to identify two major types of strategies one being notification strategies, the other physical action strategies. Notification was the who are you going to call, um, not just to help respond to the spill, 
but who are you going to call to get out of the way? Um, close that water intake valve. Um, evacuate that school. So we tried to identify in simple, you know, one-pager plans, uh, lists of contacts and notification strategies. The other side of the coin was what can you do with limited resources in the initial hours, minutes to hours of a you know, response to an incident? And uh, what can you do with, you know, one or two people? Uh, deploy a, a short length of, of pre-staged oil boom across a creek to prevent it from, you know, getting into the larger water body. Um, plug culverts, plug storm drains, you know, get a load of dirt and dump it in this ditch to stop that oil. Um, so that was, that was the focus. Um, there are, you know, we realized that when, if an incident did occur with a large volume of oil, Bill, there would be a major um, response, but it might be a day or two or three before all of the response assets would get there. Um, here's a shot of the, the GRP. This is, uh, we made a general, like a, a county-wide GRP, and we also made site-specific GRPs. If you look at this one, um, this is a, a front and back of a one sheet of paper. Uh, I believe this one was 11 by 17, but we tried our best to fit most of the plans as one-pagers, um, eight and a half by 11. Um, it's, you can see on the left side of the screen is, is the map side. On the right side is the back side, we call it. The map obviously shows where things are, um, notable features that you'd consider in a response, um, the black you know, boxes are where we have developed site-specific GRPs. Um, on the back side of the general, you know, countywide plan, you've got your uh, response contacts on top. Those are the who you're going to call to, to help. Um, there's a section of um, basically just a checklist of you know actions or or uh, response. You know, actions you could do depending on whether this is a just a derailment with no leak all the way to is it leaking or is it leaking it on fire. Um, we've got the, the major body of the backside. You've got your special receptors, your schools, your daycares, um, your hospitals, your sensitive populations that might need help in evacuation or uh, in just maybe responding to the scenario, scene, whatever it may be. On the right side is uh, critical infrastructure, both within a half mile. Um, and you've got, you know, downwind and downstream considerations. We've got firefighting resources identified in the plans. And uh, our state fire has been very, has been a, basically an equal partner in this project since day one. And they've, uh, I'll get to it in a few more slides, but they've put a lot of effort into this preparedness and planning for a crude oil transportation incident. Um, there's some seasonal, like, or just response considerations down at the bottom, and then you can see the placards. Those are flammable liquids that are, you know, commonly transported by rail. Um, we even have the QR codes that you could scan with your phone and get the emergency response guidebook or uh, our state's uh, state fire office of fire Pre prevention and control uh, guidance on fighting a crude oil fire. Um, so th actually, the, that brings me to the point that we developed these plans using state funding for crude oil preparedness, but we realize and we emphasize that these can and should be used for all hazards, especially flammable, flammable liquids, um, spills, or incidents. Um, this is just a close-up uh, of some of the response checklists, some things that we want you know, people to think about, not to tell firefighters how to fight fires, but you never know, it could be the assistant chief's first day on the job, and also in the heat of battle when <laughs> things are on fire in front of you and it's a, it's a disaster. Maybe just some kind of reminders of things to consider 
uh, check off and go through. Here's a site-specific GRP. This one's for Plattsburgh. Again, it's one pager. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of the more larger overview, like not necessarily federal, but a large scale response frameworks that are, you know, hundreds of pages of text. And we tried to, again, focus on the first responders that are going to be there before any state, federal, or railroad assets uh, will even have time to respond. So we wanted to keep them short, sweet, and simple, one pagers. Um, these site-specific plans, the locations were selected by the county steering committees, not by us. So we went to the, the county groups and said, where do you want us to develop site-specific plans? And they told us, we said, okay. Um, these are zoomed in. You know, they're especially prominent for uh, population, you know, cities where there's population centers. Um, but any other area the county identified, we would do. Um, they have more detailed information and site-specific context than the county-wide GRP. Um, and we're not just making paper plans and passing them out. We're in the middle of a spill response equipment procurement process um, where we're going out and buying uh, several dozen spill response, you know, trailers, mobile, mobile trailers with, loaded with oil, boom, sorbent pads, uh, and sweep, and the tools required to deploy them, you know, your anchors and your buoys and your shovels or your stakes and your, uh, your chains and your rope, whatever. Um, we also are stocking them up with additional land-based spill response equipment, stuff like filter fences for drainage ditches if there's a spill along the tracks where there's, where there's no water, it's still going to flow. And at every GRP development meeting, we always pose the question, if there was a spill here, where would it go? What would it do? Who would it impact? You know, what's, what's downhill and what's downstream? Um, so we've, we've tried to, you know, shift the focus from the traditional water-based spills at sea getting to shorelines, again, to the, you know, potential of spills on land just impacting the land and the, the, the area around it. So we've got additional equipment such as underflow dams that you could use to, you know, dam up a small drainage ditch or a stream, um, you know, storm drain plug, I think, um, covers and other materials for spills on land. Um, and our partners at State Fire have, have already already achieved a distribution of firefighting foam, which is specialized for fighting um, crude oil fires uh, throughout the state. And they, so they have pre-staged response foam, you know, foam deployment uh, trailers at, at locations that are basically two hours away from any point in the state and focused on the crude oil main line. They also have the, we have the Norfolk Southern line is the, along the southern tier of our state. Um, and it's not just crude oil we're concerned about, we're concerned about any transportation incidents, but again, the funding was from crude oil. Um, you know, it's important, I guess every uh, planning discussion talks about multi-agency coordination, so we did that. Um, this is a shot of just, you know, uh, DEC, Coast Guard, um, and that's, that's all we have there. But we coordinated with, you know, county agencies. We, I was on a boat with, you know, the West, Westchester PD surveying the Hudson, the lower Hudson River. Um, we got assistance from State Fire, Health, uh, all, these, all these other state agencies. And we especially involved the local agencies. That was, that was the big emphasis on our efforts. So just a quick look, and I know we're almost out of time, um, here we are, but uh, just kind of a survey of what other states are doing with the GRPs. Alaska was kind of the, 
the first one to do it um, because they had to because of Exxon Valdez and, all, and back then there was a lot more oil uh, or a lot less oil inland and a lot more on the sea. Massachusetts has done a great job putting an emphasis on the local response assets. Um, Washington State's done an excellent job pioneering uh, the, the riverine and like the Columbia River Gorge, GRPs. Um, they actually came to play not too, like two weeks ago. Um, but Washington gave us a lot of help uh, starting out. When we were starting out in New York State, we were a little bit behind the, the game uh, compared to the, some of these other states that had a lot more coastal oil concerns. Um, Florida, California, basically I did a Google, a Google search on geographic response plans and you know a lot of states have them but these are the ones that kind of came up to the top of the list. Um, but I can say that I, as far as I know, we, New York is the only one doing true on land GRPs um, and hopefully someone will correct me if I'm wrong but I'm not aware of anyone else that's focusing not just on spills getting to water or spills coming, you know, down downstream, but actually spills on dirt that are going to catch fire, or could catch fire, and impact populations or locations that are nowhere near water bodies. So that's that's all I had. Um, I could talk longer uh, about the components of everything, but you guys have have seen the the overview of what we're doing in New York and you know we're about to start cooperating with uh, other states, neighboring states that are maybe Vermont and New Jersey um, that are you know developing starting to develop similar similar response plans. And I'll leave that up just for a second, but uh, I had one more slide just uh, from the Mosier, Oregon uh, derailment that happened June 3rd. Um, just to kind of emphasize the point that now this was very close to the Columbia River, but and, and some oil did actually make its way to the river, some sheen. Um, but from what I understand, uh, most of the impact was the fire and the evacuation and the human health concerns. Environmental is always a, a real and top priority, but we tried to kind of emphasize the importance of the human health and safety aspect um, for the railroad GRPs. And we call them we call them inland GRPs. They're they're on land, inland, and on water. They're multi purpose, but they're they're built around the railroads. So thanks for your time and that's that's basically all I had. Hey uh, hey Tom Real quickly, this is Ralph Elhoff. I just have to come in on your last slide to reinforce what you've been saying about planning. My sources tell me that uh, for the Mosier Oregon response that many of the entities who ended up responding to that had participated in an exercise of their contingency plan several weeks prior to this incident. So it's a classic example of what you're talking about. So planning leading to effective response. And I've heard that this was a well-organized response as well, so I, I just felt compelled to add that. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Ralph. And let me just add one more comment on that same line of thought. We had a small derailment in Ripley, which is like basically the Pennsylvania border uh, and New York. So it's the first town you encounter when you're coming when you're bringing your unit train to New York, taking it to Albany, to take either onto a ship or down down to Jersey. But anyway, uh, we had just developed the geographic response plan railroad base for Chautauqua County, which is where Ripley was. It wasn't finalized, but it was it had been distributed as draft form, and the review and comment period was done, and we were just making the final revisions when there was a small I'd say minor uh, derailment. They're never minor. I, I don't know exactly how many cars derailed. I think it was eight, um, two of which had ethanol, and there was a leak. But the take home was that everyone in, in Chautauqua County that responded to this 
had their GRPs in hand on the way to the scene, and they all knew each other because they had recently gone through a four-hour meeting where everybody from, you know, the sewer guy to the fire chief were talking about what would we do if something happened along here. Tom, so, thanks, thanks a lot. I'm going to try to jump in here because we got some okay. questions that people have put up. Okay. Um, I want to thank both speakers, but uh, first question we collected is, I understand Congress just passed a pipeline safety bill in the last two days uh, and is on the way to be signed by the President. Does anyone know what the bill covers for Great Lakes pipeline issues? Because that would uh, direct to Ralph. Well, I'm aware that at a minimum it is focused on pipelines that operate in the Great Lakes and across underneath the Great Lakes. So there are several crossings of Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River in the Detroit area. There's, of course, the Embridge Line 5 crossing under the Straits of Mackinac. That's a five-mile underwater crossing between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. And my understanding is that the new legislation will require the pipeline companies to be subjected to stronger standards with respect to response. Um, uh, I don't know the details of that yet. I, I think that those pipelines will have to be uh, treated like vessels or other offshore facilities, and so they're stricter planning requirements and perhaps uh, stricter requirements for the companies demonstrating that they have the financial viability to handle uh, spills should they occur. And, and that, of course, in the Great Lakes region is, uh, you know, there's lots of stakeholder concern about the Line 5 crossing and some of the St. Clair crossings. So that's what I can tell you about that, but I, I'll also mention that there's pending rulemaking uh, regarding the preparation of comprehensive oil spill contingency plans associated with unit trains as well, or unit trains are now called high hazard flammable trains, uh, flammable liquid trains, and that's something for people to keep an eye on as well. Currently these unit trains that Tom was talking about are not uh, comprehensively required to have the same type of facility response plans that pipelines and other fixed facilities are. So watch for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a few questions here kind of dealing with lessons learned from the, uh, the Enbridge Line 6K discharge. Um, I think I can kind of roll them into one. Um, what specifically would have made the biggest difference in ultimate response success if we knew then what we know now? Um, it goes to planning, and uh, Tom actually mentioned it. it remember the two-mile stretch of creek it, with good contingency planning and good community awareness and good uh, interest from the company with the recognition that that was a a point of vulnerability, there could have been pre-positioning of assets, response resources and assets in that area that may have prevented that oil from getting into the river. So, for example, suppose the company had to pay to stage, uh, you know, 5,000 yards of soil in a pile somewhere in that area and pay for a couple of bulldozers and even their operators to be on standby constantly to the tune of maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. It sounds like a lot of money, it is a lot of money, but pales in comparison to the 1.3 billion that the company ended up spending on the cleanup because it got into the Kalamazoo River. That's an example of the type of pre-scripted play, if you will, that these GRPs set up so that uh, they, you know, impact can be limited. So in my opinion, that is, that's planning, that's planning and preparedness that, that's an example of, of what could have been done. There, there are others, and I can get into okay. those, but, yeah. 
Thank you. Go ahead. Um, one, one more question on, on the, uh, for EPA, I guess. Um, it is my understanding that an, indicate, an indicator that oil is present is surface sheen. With submerged oil, is that causing the EPA to develop a different set of indicators? With polling, that only works in very shallow bodies of water. What would you use in deeper bodies of water like the Great Lakes? Well, we've written a number of papers on the topic of the use of science to uh, help mitigate the effects of sunken oil. It, you can't rely upon any one single uh, technology. You have to you have to be able to look at chaining. You have to find ways to sample sediments. You have to think about remote. Uh, sensing techniques, and so what we emphasize is a multiple lines of evidence approach where you you converge down on how to detect and then recover the submerged soil because it's all about detection. You can't you can't see it; it's out of sight. But there's no silver bullet when it comes to detecting it, and so it's about science, and you have to get the science going early because. You, you know that you, you're going to need it in the end, and it, it takes time for the science to develop. Great. The, okay. Thank you. Um, I guess a question for Tom. Um, what mechanisms are in place to keep GRPs up to date? So we've committed to uh, update them once every three years as a, as a state. Um, we also... It, uh, as a deliverable, as one of the you know product uh, products of the project, we distribute the GRPs in several forms. One being, you know, static PDF maps. So each county, you know, would get their their county. Um, they're publicly available. Um, we also distribute the publisher files that are used used to make up the backsides and the ArcMap uh, MXD package that's used to make the map side. So anybody uh, is welcome to update them more frequently. Um, you know, if, if uh, phone numbers change, contacts change, you know, departments change, you can update the GRPs. Um, we have in New York State DEC, you know, that's basically what I've been working on, so if something comes in that needs updating, I, I could try to do that and uh, repost the plan. Um, we also have Google Earth uh, deliverable, so KMZ files. So everything that's on the maps is available in Google Earth format. Um, so you could, if you have Google Earth, it's a free platform of, you know, it's a mapping, visualization, you could, you know, load that up, you know, open it in Google Earth and click on a dot and then the phone number will pop up, the name of the feature, uh, contact person, all that stuff. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think we better um, wrap up at this point. Um, I think I'm supposed to hand it back to Jill. Uh, thanks, Mark. I, I, I just wanted to uh, just wrap up. Uh, we are... Um, at about 2.15 now. So I would like, uh, wanted to again thank Ralph and Tom for their willingness to talk to us again today about their work. Really an excellent discussion, great presentations, Ralph and Tom. Also, um, a thank you to Mark for moderating the event. Uh, this is a webinar series that was um, created by Great Lakes Sea Grant Network and the Great Lakes Commission. I wanted to also remind you that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature, so please take a few minutes to fill that out. I also wanted to refer you to resources and an archive of all our previous webinar presentations, which are located on our um, go.osu.edu slash crude move webpage. Again, this webinar series was sponsored by the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network as well as uh, Great Lakes Commission. And we will have another webinar August 17th discussing regulatory activities and environmental re requirements when it comes to crude oil transport. Uh, registration is up at the go.osu.edu slash crude move webpage. Thanks again to uh, Tom, Ralph, Mark, 
and all the participants for joining us and have a great afternoon. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you.